Good afternoon and welcome to our online discussion on the topic North Macedonia's path to the EU, what comes next? Uh, I am Valeska Esch, um, I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Germany and I would like to very warmly welcome our two uh, speakers of today. Um, Sabine Stör, um, who's the Director of uh, for the EU financial framework and EU policies at the German Federal Foreign Office and was previously the head of the Western Balkans division. So she's a great expert, not only on, on the EU, but also on the region. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining, Davina Stör. And uh, Marco Troshanowski, um, who's the president of the Institute for Democracy Societas Civilis from Skopje, an independent think tank from North Macedonia, promoting democratization, good governance and the rule of law. Um, warm welcome also to you, Marco. As many of you already know from uh, previous events, uh, we will have a moderated discussion in the first part of this online event. And in the second part, you will be able to ask your own questions. Feel free to already uh, send them in in writing now or use the raise hand function uh, later um, to, to, to come in yourself. This discussion will take place on the record and we are recording the debate um, and we'll publish it also on our YouTube channel. And um, finally, I would like to thank um, Open Society Foundations and the Federal Press Agency for their support um, of this project and this event. Um, unfortunately, we have not heard, ha received good news uh, from the General Affairs Council today, um, as North Macedonia and Albania were hoping for a positive decision on a date for their first intergovernmental conferences, and especially for North Macedonia, this was a big disappointment. The country already received candidate status in 2005 and was one of the front runners in the region together with Croatia, which joined in 2013. Since 2009, the Commission has continuously recommended to open accession negotiations with North Macedonia. However, the Council was unable to agree due to a Greek veto over a name dispute with the country, back then the former Yugoslav Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, in 2015, uh, the country stumbled into political crisis when a large wiretap scandal by the then government was revealed, as a result of which there was a change in government and current Prime Minister Zoran Zaev was elected for his first mandate. Since then, the country has made remarkable progress. Um, it signed a friendship treaty with its neighbor Bulgaria, and it found a compromise with Greece on the open issues between both countries, unblocking the Euro-Atlantic integration of the country, leading to NATO membership for North Macedonia and the formal opening of accession negotiations. However, the next steps, the agreement with the EU on the negotiating framework and the first intergovernmental conference marking the official start of accession negotiations are blocked. Um, and already last year, the council was unable to agree as it requires unanimity and the Bulgarian government has raised concerns regarding the implementation and some would say interpretation of the friendship treaty. Um, and this is where I would like to hand over to you, Marco. Um, can you explain in just a few sentences what the issue with Bulgaria is about and um, especially also what the mood now in the country is, um, as it seems that it will be unlikely uh, for the council to, to agree um, to the negotiating framework um, soon. What are the expectations also in North Macedonia, how things can continue? Marco, flo the floor is yours. You need to unmute. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valeska. Um, I, uh, I really much uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss this, especially with Sabine Stoer, who is really knowledgeable on the region and committed uh, uh, as well throughout, uh, throughout the years. Uh, so uh, with regard to your first uh, question, giving a brief context with, on Bulgaria and North Macedonia relations, uh, uh, it is uh, it is difficult to, to say, of course, in, in, in few words. The point is that uh, Bulgaria was the first uh, to recognize the country uh, since its independence. It re but it recognized uh, the country, but never the language uh, and the uh, and the nation. It considered the language to be a dialect of the Bulgarian uh, language and the nation to be the subgroup of uh, of Bulgarian uh, nation. Uh, so. Uh, Never in the past Bulgaria was perceived as an obstacle for the for the our uh, for Macedonian new ambitions. Uh, on the contrary, it supported them uh, explicitly until a few years ago, when obviously all this uh, appeared to be a strategic camouflage. Uh, I would say um, historically, uh, both parties had close uh, relations. 
and went uh, to a certain segment into intertwined nation building processes as almost every country uh, in Europe, uh, right? Uh, but uh, at the outbreak of the World War II, uh, um, Bulgaria occupied the territory of modern uh, day uh, North Macedonia and committed atrocities against the population and the communist uh, uh, movements. Uh, so since then, uh, the, the relations between the both countries are uh, suffocated between the competing uh, official uh, narratives uh, of the country on, on what actually happened. And this uh, is a problem on every level of bilateral uh, communication at the moment. Uh, uh, be it the culture or, or uh, infrastructure or, or economic uh, cooperation. Uh, so uh, uh, to settle this uh, set, uh, a series of agreements were signed, the last one being the treaty on joint uh, on, uh, on good neighboring relations and cooperation, uh, which is uh, actually, uh, uh, which was meant to facilitate uh, and to speed up in a way the reconciliation and the collaboration between Two countries. The treaty came with no roadmap or action plan or indicators for implementation. And, uh, and uh, uh, the Bulgarian perspective now is that there is insufficient implementation of, of the agreement, although we, there are no any tangible uh, factual uh, figures on, on, this, uh, on these claims. And this is the reason why it cannot uh, support the negotiation framework and starting with the International Conference, uh, International Government Conference, uh, Intergovernment Conference, sorry, um, uh, for Macedonia. So uh, basically, in a nutshell, uh, this is uh, this is it. And uh, the, today's uh, experience from the, I mean, today's outcome from the General Affairs Council only confirms that uh, this is a big wall. Uh, there is a, still a big wall between uh, both uh, both countries, and I'm pretty much pessimist that in the future things will uh, will soon change. Uh, on, the, on the other side, how, how, how do uh, things stand uh, in Macedonia, in North Macedonia after, after this? Uh, this was your uh, second question. So uh, we have to focus on the solution of this problem and not uh, on, on uh, uh, additional requirements for, uh, for reforms, I would say. With, uh, with the previous uh, blockages of North Macedonia and even uh, and particularly with, with this one, EU starts to lose ground in the Western Balkan. It's not a question that the, that the credibility is under risk and so forth. It is losing ground already. So this is the realistic uh, perception and we have to face it and uh, make bold political moves on the side of EU primarily if you want this to work out. Uh, um, if I have to write an if I had to write an article on the context, the title would be North Macedonia from Poster Child to Foster Child. Uh, the social psychology in the in the country ranges currently from uh, cynicism and frustration to, to complete apathy. Uh, comprehensive studies that were done on public perception uh, just recently show declining trends uh, uh, on, on many aspects of, of perceptions of, of EU. Uh, matters, uh, uh, only one third of the population considers that the country is closer uh, to you to, uh, today than it was 2005 when we applied for it. But uh, even worse, what is even worse is that the democratic demand is deteriorating. So only half of the population now thinks democracy is the best system of governance compared uh, to, to last year when it was higher for 10%. And other half think that there are better alternatives or, uh, or there are other equally good, uh, good systems. And uh, there is also another very important aspect that uh, uh, domestic reforms are not key for uh, success in the accession process. So all these three are very concerning uh, variables that are, that are shown. Optimistic observers, external observers of the situation would say, but the support for EU is very high and it was continuously above 70%. That is true. But if you put into context with these other figures, uh, the, the fact is that uh, Europe uh, with less rule of law, less merit and less democracy is more and more acceptable among the people uh, in the country. Confidence institution is, is decreasing and uh, civil society and the agents of uh, uh, social change are also uh, losing uh, their uh, leverage. This is reflected on the political arena. 
We have anti-NATO party for the first time in the parliament. They, will, uh, they already doubled and they tripled the support until the next elections and may become kingmakers in the forming of new government. So problems, terms like political crisis, big sliding may, may, may re-emerge. And I'm not uh, exaggerating here. This is the, the realistic uh, context of the, of the things uh, at, the, at the moment. So, the, so uh, uh, we have to keep up the momentum on the side of, Mas of North Macedonia. We have to exercise as we are starting the negotiation tomorrow. We don't still have negotiation structure uh, adjusted to the new methodology. Uh, we have transposed 30% uh, of the legislation of you into the domestic uh, legislative uh, system, but, uh, but we still have to, uh, have to work on it. Uh, and of course, uh, we, with full respect to the implementation of stabilization association agreement, uh, uh, we have to also keep in mind that this process as well. Uh, what is important on the side of the EU? Uh, to keep the momentum, we have to start the bilateral screenings, the fast track procedure, no matter if the ICG, uh, if the intergovernmental conference is not uh, yet uh, happening or will not happen. The council conclusions from March last year allowed this and the commission uh, uh, got to this task. So it is very important. Why? Because it will weave the burden from the political realm to the more technical aspect where people can, uh, and civil society and the administration can discuss on everyday matters that are uh, important uh, for the people. What, you, uh, what, what the council and commission can also do uh, is uh, the parliament, for example, European parliament can start a resolution to keep bilateral issues out of the negotiation uh, association negotiation process, particularly the historical considerations. And also the council, the presidency can open a debate or even draft uh, proposal conclusions where the predictability of the process will be uh, more defined. Otherwise, it's not only our problem uh, between North Macedonia and Bulgaria, you know, Serbia and Kosovo is the key uh, uh, problem here, but there are also many other lingering co uh, conflicts that are just waiting for their time. Thank you, Marco, especially for, for trying to also uh, come up with, with a few concrete suggestions of yeah. how, to, how to mitigate this, this difficult situation that you are describing. Um, I, would, I would like to hand over to, to Sabine Stör. Germany has, has been not only one of the strongest supporters of the Western Balkans in the European Union, but also invested a lot in, in finding a compromise between Bulgaria and, and North Macedonia um, for, for, for the conflict that Marco described to, to allow for North Macedonia to continue on, on its path. Especially, of course, after North Macedonia was blocked, as I said earlier, for so many years over the over the famous uh, name dispute with Greece. How how, in your view, can the country trust that it is going to be able to continue its path uh, to, into the European Union? And in your view, how how should the North Mas the government of North Macedonia deal with this impasse? Um, and in, in your view, especially amidst this growing disappointment of the and the public pressure that that Marco descri described. Sabine Stör, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe um, I, I would start with describing or uh, talking a little bit about uh, the perspective of the EU on, uh, on the situation we're in. Um, because um, I think that still, uh, although, although uh, there was no decision taken today, um, very few people um, expected it. I mean, I always said 15% chances uh, that, uh, that we managed today, uh, but very low chances. And that is um, especially also because of the internal political situation in Bulgaria. Um, technical government uh, snap elections on the 11th of July um, and no parliament basically and and we all know that uh, the, the government rightly or not always refers to a, to a parliament resolution um, which uh, which uh, defines its position so I think um, it is not the fault of uh, the current presidency which did a very good job uh, Portugal to develop uh, the, the, the proposals which had been developed uh, during the German uh, presidency of the council and built on that, add another element and really engage into talks both with uh, Sofia and Skopje on, on that proposal. So what they basically proposed is 
to root uh, or to, to anchor the implementation uh, of, uh, of or the, to anchor the good neighborly relations and especially the implementation of the neighborhood treaty, not in the negotiation process, not in the negotiation framework, but to talk about it in the SAA, in the stabilization and association process, which I think is a smart idea. Um, in the end, um, I think uh, this would add objectivity to the process. Uh, and still it is not, it would not be uh, the, the negotiation framework. And that is something 26 uh, member states of the EU continue to object. Um, and what I like to tell, um, especially our Bulgarian friends, that we don't object that uh, out of sympathy or over overly huge understanding for Macedonia, but because in principle, we do not believe that uh, bilateral issues, uh, especially those rooted in the past, especially those uh, in connection with very difficult historical problems, should be uh, should be part of of the EU uh, negotiate of the EU accession process. It's uh, it's counter to the to the very sort of sense and raison d'etre of the EU to make such issues uh, the driving forces of uh, cooperation or non-cooperation, to make that uh, the, the essential point. I mean, I could say that the whole uh, the EU was invented or the European communities were invented just to overcome uh, such issues or to make practical, pragmatic cooperation to the benefit of all sides possible despite all the problems. And it's very interesting. Um, whenever I talk to colleagues uh, from other EU member states, whether they are knowledgeable of Western Balkan or Balkans uh, history or not, nearly everyone understands immediately. And a colleague from the Southwest also has a big neighbor who, say, who would say, okay, if they would behave like that, we wouldn't like it. Uh, and maybe they wouldn't like if we raised issues or made those issues, which we still have uh, bilaterally part or hamper the cooperation within the EU. And, and that's um, a very strong conviction. It's a very strong conviction of the German government, which uh, was the guiding factor for what we tried to do and all the work uh, we were trying to do uh, during our presidency. And it has become a common, common sense uh, in the council. So I can really say, uh, that we made huge progress since, let's say, a year ago, when people didn't realize that there is a big problem. Um, and after they realized that one country has an issue, they, it was very difficult to understand, uh, because they thought it's about um, how a Tsar of the 12th century is being assessed, uh, or, or uh, what words uh, are, are written somewhere on a monument. Uh, but it's not. It's about the fact that we don't have to solve those problems. Those problems exist between all member states uh, to a certain degree. No one is without problems with their neighbors, and especially historical ones in Europe are very common. So it's even not a speciality of the Western Balkans, um, but uh, everyone has, has uh, such problems. And the very uh, raison d'etre of the EU is to have pragmatic cooperation and then everyone will tell you, be they Italian or Portuguese or whatever, uh, that a, a solution uh, of such problems, and of course uh, everyone has to work on them and they should not persist, a solution comes when there is a good pragmatic cooperation in the framework of the European Union. Uh, I'm Quite sure that, <laughs> that, that uh, of course, I'm not telling anything new to you, but I think it is very important to stress this uh, as, as the argument, uh, because we sometimes hear, why uh, do you always believe the, North Mas the, the Macedonians, they're much better in having a good narrative, etc. It's not about that. We also understand uh, what, what our friends from Skopje tell us. 
we also understand the problems uh, our friends from Sofia might have with certain issues. And we are very firm in saying that all these things should be solved. A lot of work has to be done, but it must not hamper the practical and pragmatic cooperation within the EU, hence the, uh, the accession process. And again, the big progress we have made, uh, I think, uh, since, uh, since a year ago, maybe, uh, is that this has become common sense and more and more people are exactly stressing uh, this uh, and, and the importance of taking the decision now and not accepting discussions on views on what a language is and etc. because it's, this is not what we want to discuss about. We want to discuss about how uh, North Macedonia can uh, can take over over the key. So um, actually, I'm not so pessimistic. I did not expect uh, that the president and um, or, or caretaker, foreign minister or European minister uh, from Sofia would be able to move and uh, to sort of change uh, the, the, the position the government um, has been taken and the, and the parliament has been taken. Uh, we will see uh, what happens. What is clear is that the more nationalistic narrative didn't pay off uh, in the last elections in Bulgaria. Um, this was nothing uh, you, you got way, uh, voted for. Uh, we will see, of course, uh, how parliament looks like on the, on the 11th uh, of, of July or after that. Um, but we have a very good proposal on the table. Uh, we keep telling the Portuguese presidency who proposed it and others that it is very hard on our red lines because uh, it has some opening for the link between bilateral treaties um, and especially the uh, Macedonian-Bulgarian Friendship Treaty and the negotiation framework, but that we would be able to accept it, uh, but not go any further. And again, uh, this um, independently from the internal situation in North Macedonia and what is possible for North Macedonia or not, but this are out of principle because such things um, don't belong there. Um, but if uh, we have um, a more optimistic uh, view on this, uh, I think what uh, the Portuguese conclusion was today is uh, that, their, um, that their proposal still remains on the table, that it enjoys overwhelming support by member states, and that they invite uh, the following the Slovenian Council Presidency to take this proposal up as soon as possible, which means not on, not uh, not in the end of their of their semester, uh, not in December, but as soon as possible. Um, that would be the General Affairs Council, uh, maybe in in September, and then with the hope uh, to bring it to a good conclusion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also for these clarifications. Um, Marco, I, you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned earlier democratic demand is deteriorating in North Macedonia, while at the same time it was the colorful revolution on the street that literally brought about a change um, after the wiretap uh, scandal. So, so I would really um, like to hear from you a bit more um, how you would see the progress when it comes to um, internal reforms. We've talked about the, the, the relationship with Bulgaria. We've briefly mentioned the PRESPA agreement. Um, but we have also seen legal proceedings against former government officials, including the former prime minister Nik Nikola Gruevski. We've seen um, efforts by the North Macedonian government um, in improving also um, on, on the rule of law. How would you evaluate the reforms in the field of democracy and rule of law so far? And now, how, where do you see the biggest risks beyond um, democratic demand um, is, is, is declining? Um, how would you see this? Uh, well, Ever, ever since the, the urgent reform priorities set by the European Commission and the famous PRIVA report in 2015, uh, that came out as a, as a document after the, the, the country was designated as capture state, uh, uh, the conclusion, the, the, the underlying uh, conclusion was that the legal framework uh, is satisfactory as a precondition for, uh, for rule of law, so to say. And the progress since then uh, was uh, was big. Uh, I can confirm it. The current problem is in the uh, integrity of governance. The political elites, 
democratization of political parties, maybe the electoral model and so forth. But this is another point of, of discussion. Uh, uh, the reforms that, uh, that the country uh, managed to achieve uh, uh, contribute significantly to judicial independence and, uh, and, uh, and uh, accountability, sorry. Uh, uh, there are rules on merit-based appointments, uh, checking assets co and conflict of interest, disciplinary procedures for uh, judges and, uh, and prosecutors. There is law on public prosecutor office and so forth. So uh, the civil society is strongly engaged. It was engaged in the uh, national strategy for corruption, the laws that, thing, that tackle anti-corruption and the fight uh, for, uh, uh, and fight against it. Uh, so uh, there are many good uh, reforms in terms of uh, of legislative uh, uh, or, or in terms of rules. Um, uh, the track record was also very good, as you mentioned. There, there are. We have uh, efficient, uh, effective verdicts uh, for high-level corruption. It's not only the prime minister, it's the uh, former uh, chief of the secret police, the president of the Supreme Court and the criminal court, uh, then the former minister of interior and so forth. Even now, uh, the ex, now ex uh, uh, secretary general of the government is at home arrest under indictment for high-level corruption. And this was case that was raised by the independent media sector and further on pursued by the public prosecutor office, despite the initial ignorance and even resistance by the government uh, to, to admit it. Uh, so uh, there are islands of integrity, I would say, in the system that keep the, uh, uh, the although very, in a very difficult way, they keep the checks and uh, imbalances uh, uh, at the moment. But they are all under a huge risk, especially uh, if the process of a session is delayed for indefinitely and the frustration rises because the pressure on the, the corruption press, pressure, the state capture uh, pressure is still here. It never, uh, uh, it was, never, it was never completely gone. Even Priba mentioned that just right after writing the report. So we don't still we still don't have efficient uh, collaboration between the public prosecution and the uh, police and other law enforcement bodies. The legislative and executive branch are still uh, having influence in appointment and uh, promotion of judges. Uh, we had a list of uh, appointed senior uh, uh, prosecutors just recently that leaked one day before their actual appointing uh, appointment. So. Uh, uh, Things are not uh, perfect, but uh, as I said, there are uh, co uh, pros and, and, and cons uh, on the situation. On the other side, the, 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 state, uh, the pressure on state capture is increasing, for state uh, capture is increasing. In the private sector, people are paying to get things done, but also on the level of, uh, of the state, of the governing, of the uh, governance with the institution, uh, it is pretty much uh, present, especially in the public procurement sector, considering uh, uh, infrastructural, energetic uh, uh, projects regarding the energy sector and so forth. There is inefficient corporate uh, uh, governance uh, structures within the state-owned enterprises and the regulatory oversight uh, is missing. But however, we are among the lowest in the region comparatively in, in that sense. The, the environmental crime is on the rise. I'm not talking about uh, timber, uh, regular stuff like timber, uh, river sand and stuff like that, but uh, there is uh, uh, trafficking of dirty oil from the European uh, oil, oil, uh, oil factory that is uh, smuggled into the country and the customs here played, uh, played a very uh, um, interesting role, I, I, I can say. There is also legislative capture, uh, primarily in the field of construction where laws are uh, adopted to the demands of the so-called construction lobby and uh, and uh, on, uh, on and dirty money are invested in this business on the expense of the environmental uh, impact uh, so uh, uh, still uh, if you if you uh, if you compare uh, things macedonia and north macedonia and albania have had marginal decrease in corruption pressure compared to a few years ago and what is the difference is the difference the difference is that there was clear political pressure from eu and clear short-term goals on their EU accession horizon to perform better. So this is one of the uh, uh, arguments why if we are still in a stalemate, bi uh, uh, bilateral experience has to be uh, uh, started. 
especially in the fundamentals. We have to keep the momentum because uh, these uh, islands of integrity will, will fade away. What we can do when we, are, uh, when, uh, when we come to the recommendations, what the EU can do uh, actually, uh, the, the council and the commission should consider to include as soon as possible and to the biggest possible extent the countries of Western Balkan, including North Macedonia, into the uh, European mechanisms, the European mechanism on uh, rule of law, on fight against corruption and organized crime, the European public prosecutor here, the justice court board, uh, the European semester and so forth. And also uh, commitments of Western Balkan countries within the Berlin process to abide the European public procurement rules is something that uh, will be uh, positive, I would say. Thank, thank you, Marco. And and actually, this is this is exactly what I what I would like um, to ask you, um, Davine Stör, about. But bef before I do, um, I would like to invite everyone um, from the audience, if you have questions to or, or comments, to raise your hand or send them in, in writing. If you do send them in writing, please keep them short. I'm not going to to read out a long long um, context. And if you want to give a bit of context, you, you will have to raise your hand. And please also add uh, who you direct your question at and briefly introduce yourself. Um, and now, um, um, Sabine Stör, um, Marco, Marco was mentioning, um, I would call it maybe the fra fragility of, of the process. And we have seen several structural pro problems in the accession processes over the past years. The two front runners on paper, Montenegro and Serbia, did not necessarily advance in the fundamentals of the accession process. We've, we've talked about the huge disappointment in North Macedonia and, and, and certainly also in Albania. Um, at the same time, we're, we're seeing a renewed engagement of, of the US in the region um, with a renewed sanctions policy um, also for Western Balkans, targeting actors engaged in threatening peace and stability in the region, undermining democratic processes or engaging in serious human rights abuses and corruption. The EU is by far the biggest donor, the most important trade partner, and uh, countries um, of the region are in many ways already integrated. Do we need to get tougher as well, consider a freeze of support or even sanctions over disruptive behavior? Is this something that you would uh, agree to agree with? And to, to pick up also what, what Marco just said, and we have a question related to that also in the chat. What do you think about um, considering including the Balkans in EU mechanisms on the rule of law, the European semester, public prosecutor, etc. cetera, um, earlier on in the process. Davina Stör, please. Yeah. Um, first, I would like to stress that we are very happy um, that the US is back um, and back with us um, also when it comes uh, to the Western Balkans. Um, so I think that is very good news. I have not heard about the special sanctions regime for the Western Balkans, but um, about applying uh, the, the Magnitsky sanctions um, uh, to individuals uh, from an EU member state, which actually raised a lot of questions. Uh, they are not the first. I mean, the, the, the sanctioning uh, or listing um, citizens of, of Bulgaria in that case um, under the Magnitsky Act, uh, they are by far not the first uh, European citizens uh, who, who are sanctioned or who are on, on such lists. Um, but what um, I think the EU should think about after that is why couldn't we do it by ourselves? Uh, and that, of course, is true uh, for, uh, for um, EU member states, uh, where, of course, there are problems in all EU member states. But uh, shouldn't we use our own mechanisms better to support countries in overcoming such phenomena? Um, so that is a question we, we now have to think about. Um, and uh, you mentioned, uh, Marco, there's, of course, the new prosecutor's office. Um, there's OLAF. Um, there are other possibilities um, that, that can be used and, and should be used uh, when it comes to talking about our, our own house uh, so far being our house and hopefully very soon also yours. Um, and the same, of course, is true uh, when we come to our uh, direct neighbors and, and um, the, the, the inner courtyard um, of, uh, of the Western Balkan countries. Um, I'm not so sure if all those instruments uh, can be used. As I said, we first have to prove uh, that they also work uh, for, for EU member states. But yes, of course, we should look, take a closer look. We should be more explicit. 
Um, and we should uh, have a more substantial political dialogue also on the fundamentals and uh, rule of law, anti-corruption, uh, etc. Um, the famous new methodology, which is uh, enshrined in the negotiation frameworks, which are negotiated. I mean, we don't have any questions anymore how the new methodology will be implemented with Albania and North Macedonia. This has been agreed uh, during the German presidency. Uh, this new methodology foresees a more political approach um, and uh, at, at least uh, a more open political dialogue. And it also foresees um, to be more concrete in the benchmarks and in the steps um, that, that should be applied. Uh, we will see what that does to the ongoing negoti negotiation processes with uh, Montenegro and Serbia. Today, we will have the first accession, political accession conference or uh, intergovernmental conferences with those two countries um, under the new methodology, which will mean that they take over the new methodology and then we will work under it. Um, it foresees a better steering, um, more open political dialogue and uh, smaller steps defined uh, uh, to control. Um, and then, yes, now um, you, you found me, you saw me quite optimistic um, about um, sort of not having to wait for 27 more years um, to start the, uh, the accession negotiations. So I'm actually quite optimistic for early autumn uh, to, have, um, to have progress there. But I agree with you uh, in the not very likely, but maybe possible case uh, that we will not make progress and we get a real stalemate. Uh, we will have to think about uh, how to support North Macedonia uh, in in uh, in the reforms. Um, and um, this steering uh, could be um, could be a way. Um, because um, I mean, yeah. We have to incentivize uh, to incentivize uh, the reforms. Still, I'm hoping, um, and that is maybe a question back to Marco. Uh, still, I'm hoping that people. Um, I mean, I, I would imagine that uh, that the people in North Macedonia they would like to see the start of the accession negotiations because they want to see real change in their country. Uh, and still, while we don't have any conditions to be fulfilled concerning reforms be before starting the accession negotiations, there is, of course, a lot to be done uh, before joining, uh, also in the fundamentals. And you mentioned some, uh, some of those issues. So, um, but I still, while, while I'm not naive and I know how important the perspective is and the real perspective and the accession process and the constant, constant control, dialogue, demands, et cetera, um, there's still a lot which can be done by the government. And actually what people really feel is that things change for themselves and that's what they demand. Um, so while I see that the incentive is very important and of course we must not linger on with starting really the accession negotiations, I, I fully agree with that. But at the same time, um, do you see anything uh, the, the people would demand from the government, uh, just independently from uh, from uh, the EU accession process, because all uh, the reforms should be done to the benefit of the people. Marco, go ahead. Well, uh, this type of uh, narrative is quite uh, novelty in the political discourse in Macedonia. Uh, Let's bring Europe uh, home. This is this is the, the this is the uh, the, the logo. Uh, but unfortunately, for the past twenty years, it was not the case. So uh, EU was the uh, was the main reason, and the entire narrative was evolving around doing something because we have to do it uh, for uh, for the sake of the accession uh, for the accession process. This created a maneuvering space for the domestic political elites to blame it always to the EU for the lack of genuine reforms at home. And, it, and they found this too uh, very, uh, very useful, <laughs> uh, so to say, for, uh, for, for years and years. But, but, but now 
the, all the lies are on the political elites. Of course, there are uh, narratives of victimization that, uh, uh, and to a certain point, of course, they are, they are true, but uh, uh, the, now nobody can escape the focus of the, of the public where uh, the only responsibility for, uh, for not delivering will, the, on domestic reforms will be put on the, on the, on the local political elite. So I, I see a window of opportunity uh, here, uh, uh, here in a way. Although this process, as you know, are complementary and they go in, in, in parallel and you cannot uh, always uh, uh, develop full awareness among the population that it is all about, uh, about themselves only in a short period of time. Just thank you. Just to say, because uh, your question also was, uh, Valeska, about um, did the EU accession process so far did it deliver? And uh, now talking maybe of of countries that are already in the process, and uh, of course it does not fully deliver. Of course there are persisting problems, and even problems in member states and. Uh, <clears throat> backsliding, etc. So I think uh, it is a very important factor, and and that is why, I mean, we want the Western Balkan countries in the EU. Uh, we want them. Um, we want to support them, and and that is what the uh, accession process is for. So again, this is a very important element, also for making progress and for bringing a country forward. But it should also not be the only driving factor, because um, we see that that is maybe not enough. Uh, we see that in 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 other countries. So um, again, uh, what what we need is working all together. Do not the homework, but do uh, for, for the politicians do what uh, they should do to be re-elected because people are demanding it from them. Um, and then at the same time, of course, work uh, to, to use all instruments which we have at our disposal. And certainly those who mentioned are worth uh, looking at. Um, should, should we, uh, should we not be successful uh, in the near future, which I believe we will be. Um, but um, but again, um, it, it could only be a, a substitute, and um, therefore, I think what we really need is to start the accession process um, and uh, and start that, and then engage uh, engage fully from all sides um, in in bringing Macedonia as closely as as quickly as possible uh, very close uh, to the accession. Thank you. Thank you for that. And and in 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 a way, you have you have brought in another topic um, that 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 I wanted to address next, which is domestic narratives. Um, as, as as they matter, they matter in terms of reforms. But we have also seen over the past months um, how much they matter also when it comes to to geopolitics. Um, we have seen that actors such as Ch Russia and China, but also Turkey, um, are very active. Have have been very active um, across the Western Balkans. Um, both with infrastructure projects, political support, but um, and, and this is, in, in my view, something that has changed, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I would I would like to ask as, ask you, Marco, especially of course with a view to to North Macedonia, but maybe you can you can widen widen your view a little. What does it mean for the EU and its role in the region? How have also maybe domestic narratives changed in that regard? Well, it is clear that the Bulgarian veto currently creates a strategic vacuum, uh, as it was put uh, just a few hours ago by uh, Minister Roth. Uh, it's a strategic vacuum in the region with uh, an unclear path towards the EU membership, the engagement of authoritarian countries from outside the region uh, in the Western Balkan is likely to increase even further. And, I mean, this is something that is already uh, very clear to, to, to everybody. Uh, I mentioned the decrease of democratic demand uh, in the uh, introduction of my of my uh, of my speech. So uh, just have this in mind. So the the the, the narrative, the perception of, of values is uh, is changing, and this this leaves quite open space in terms of uh, support for uh, for uh, foreign uh, actors. Uh, Russia, for example is supported by almost quarter of the population uh, just recently. 23% perceive it as the best ally uh, to, uh, to North Macedonia, 
uh, it was 20 last year. And Turkey is perceived by 10% of the population uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a first and, and best seller. And here we come to the vaccine diplomacy, of course, uh, uh, that, you, that you mentioned. I will just put some figures on the table and they will speak for, for themselves. From all the uh, population that is currently being uh, that is currently fully vaccinated, around 80% are vaccinated from Sinopharm uh, vaccines or from uh, vaccines that uh, or are vaccinated in Serbia or from Sputnik uh, vaccines. And some vaccines vaccines came from Turkey after three years after three days uh, that uh, the President Erdogan promised they will be delivered and so forth. And uh, uh, Mr. Commissioner Varhey Bar brought around 5,000 vaccines at the beginning, beginning of March from a portion of 120,000, I think, that were promised uh, to the country by the, by the EU to be delivered by August. So the, the figures speak, uh, speak for, for, for themselves, and uh, this definitely creates preferences and uh, uh, perceptions uh, in the population, not only in the region, but also in, in Serbia, because it was very much active in, in Bosnia uh, and the Montenegro as well uh, with, the, with the vaccine uh, diplomacy regarding the, uh, the democratic demand in general. Uh, so, but uh, you mentioned uh, 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 foreign authoritarian influence in terms of uh, in, in, the, uh, in the realm of the information space and the political symbolism, but this pretty much evolved in the past uh, years. Uh, into the systemic engagement and presence in the economy through investments uh, in energy sector, infrastructure, uh, technology, education, and you, you name it. Uh, uh, in terms of energy, I will talk about North Macedonia. In terms of, in terms of energy, our uh, energy supply is relatively diversified, the overall supply with around 60% import requirements. Uh, but uh, we are completely on, on gas, for example, we are completely dependent on Russia uh, because the entire gas in the country comes through a single pipeline uh, uh, that goes through, uh, through Bulgaria. Although the government made some steps to diversify the, the, the access to, to gas through interconnectors in Greece, on the, low, on the short run, uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia will definitely be completely dependent on Russia. And this uh, dependence will even increase because we are uh, constructing the secondary gas, uh, network of gasification now and the, the demand will, will rise, definitely. Uh, on, there is a religious influence as well, for example. There are, in the past 15 years, at least 500 uh, mosques are being built, illegally most of them, throughout many uh, rural places of, of the country. Uh, mainly by capital from, uh, from coming from uh, Middle East. And uh, from all the mosques in the country, around 700, this is the estimation, are out of uh, uh, jurisdiction or control of the official um, Islamic community uh, in, the, in, the, in the country with imams coming from Saudi Arabia. So these are uh, pretty much uh, concerning number. But, uh, Definitely, the, uh, the game in geopolitics here is the economical gap between the region and the, and the, uh, and the neighboring EU neighborhood, so to say. This is the biggest, uh, the biggest problem that needs to be uh, uh, solved and uh, uh, a discrepancy that has to be overcome. Uh, for example, in the next seven years, European uh, neighborhood around Western Balkans will receive 10 times more uh, financial support than the Western Balkan countries. And this is a huge, huge discrepancy. We have to, uh, we have to make people stay here, make living and uh, make, for example, the Macedonian farmer competitive to the Bulgarian farmer. So uh, we should introduce the council, the commission should, uh, should uh, in a way, uh, think about uh, introducing maybe specialized Western Balkan cohesion uh, funds. For example, one of, the, uh, one of the arguments on the Bulgarian side regarding not implementing the treaty is the infrastructural connection between both countries. But the cost of, of implementing, constructing roads and railroads to Bulgaria on our side and the cost on the Bulgarian side is, is immensely uh, high. So, uh, 
we, we need some kind of best, uh, best Western Balkan cohesion funds that can operate similarly or equally to the EU cohesion uh, fund to downsize these economic uh, disparities. And of course, uh, maybe a boost and a help uh, in the developing specialized agencies for cohesion policies, uh, twinning projects and so forth to increase the absorption capacities of the country. Another thing that would, uh, I would like to uh, find, I will end here uh, to stress, is the localization of supply chains. And this goes in the line with the renewed interest of, uh, of the new US administration uh, in, the, in the region and uh, the dependency on the uh, China and Asian countries regarding the supply chains. The pandemic showed that Europe is very vulnerable. And in that regard, uh, near shoring or localizing the production lines from Asia to um, among other regions, Western Balkans, can be counter, uh, can be productive for everybody and, and it will be in everybody's strategic uh, interest. Hey, thank you, Marco. And, and before I, I hand over to, to the Sabine Stör for her final remarks, looking at the time, I would like to bring in um, a question, um, another question that we received from the audience from Gudrun Steinacker. She asks what role party affiliations play um, in, in this matter between um, North Macedonia and Bulgaria. Rumors say that former Prime Minister Gryevsky in asylum in Hungary pulls strings with his EPP friends in Bulgaria in order to prevent an SDSM government from being successful in opening EU talks. And if I may add to that, could you maybe also briefly comment in general on Hungary's influence in, in, in North Macedonia? And then um, uh, th this would also be your chance for some final remarks as looking at the time. I would after that hand over to Sabine Stör for her last remarks. Well, uh, well, okay. I, I mean, uh, EPP role should be definitely uh, more uh, stronger in uh, uh, facilitating a solution between, uh, between both countries. Uh, I think uh, much more can, can be done in, in this sense, but I doubt that the role of uh, uh, particularly Nikola Gruevsky in, uh, in instrumentalizing uh, Boyko Borisov uh, party is, uh, is big. Uh, I think that uh, uh, listening to the statements by uh, uh, Prime Minister Orban and, uh, and uh, Commissioner Varhe, there, there are some concerns that uh, the support for Albania and North Macedonia is not equally uh, shared. And in terms of uh, presence of, uh, uh, of Hungary in, in Hungarian influence in uh, North Macedonia, I can say that there are currently around 10 media outlets, news portals and uh, national broadcasters, television broadcasters that are owned or uh, financially supported to, to proxy uh, sponsorship. Uh, by uh, Hungarian uh, uh, nationals, uh, former employees in uh, in major uh, television. Uh, so uh, and they are currently uh, and they are regularly uh, working on right wing uh, narratives uh, in general. But there is no explicit uh, involvement at the moment uh, whatsoever. Thank, thank you, Marco. Um, and and um, Sabine Stör, I would like to pick up um, what Marco said about the vac vaccines. He said um, the figures speak for themselves, but if the figures really speak for themselves, shouldn't the EU be much more visible in, in their support? Maybe leaving the vaccine issue um, aside, because there I think um, the EU has really been much later and, and has been delivering in much lower numbers, but there is there is more to, to all of this um, than the vaccine issue. That would be my, my last question for you. Why is it not seen um, as, as the biggest donor and supporter of the region, how can it strengthen its role again? And I'm sure you also have a few few things that Marco mentioned um, of his proposals, the need to need for some kind of um, cohesion funds to, to bridge the economic gap, etc. that you would like to comment on. So please, the floor is yours for, for your final wrap up uh, remarks. Yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, indeed, you mentioned that the vaccination issue is a difficult one. Um, it is even difficult uh, here in Germany to explain that it was a good idea to have a joint procurement of all 27 member states. Um, and one sometimes just has to tell them, but yes, what would have happened if the big and rich uh, would have gotten what they have um, and others uh, wouldn't within the EU, uh, that would have been even worse. But it's difficult to explain and maybe 
uh, that is one of the advantages of a more autocratic uh, system uh, that it does not have to care so much about our own citizens. So it's easier um, to send uh, to send uh, jabs away. Also, I mean, just to to leave it with that. So it is a very difficult issue. I also think uh, that we should have done uh, much better in supporting um, our immediate neighborhood, including, of course, uh, the Western Balkans during the pandemic. It came late. It came. Uh, I think in the end, we are doing a lot. And uh, the German way to support um, worldwide vaccination is COVAX. So we opted from the very beginning for the multilateral approach and not for the approach uh, sort of um, not so much supporting individual countries by individual countries with um, some number of, of jabs. And I strongly believe that in the end, this will really be what will change um, worldwide, uh, will, will change the situation. It takes a little bit longer. And of course, yes, it's not so visible. Uh, you're not coming with sort of uh, those vaccines and opening some centers or whatever and, and have a label that this is a German donation and this is whatever, a French donation, uh, but still COVAX and the multilateral way uh, to fight the pandemic worldwide is the right way. So um, this is something which maybe we also have to explain much better what we are doing there also concerning uh, production of vaccines, um, et cetera, not only, not only sharing them. Um, I would say the, the good news is uh, that the Europe becomes more and more, the EU becomes more and more conscious of the fact that this is a strategic issue um, and that we have to look strategically um, at uh, our external action and also at the neighborhood uh, and at the accession processes. Uh, when some years ago, it was impossible to say that to hardcore EU, diplomats in the sense of internal um, EU um, uh, civil servants saying that uh, EU accession is also a strategic issue. Um, and now um, this is also common, uh, common sense, uh, more or less. So I think that is a progress because from that analysis, um, also we can, we can act better. And that means uh, better communication and of course also more action. Um, and I find many ideas very interesting, um, and, and uh, we have to look at, at those instruments. Uh, but again, the good news is that uh, there is a much better understanding about the challenges. So the one is uh, the whole accession process and, and the work uh, towards Western Balkans, and then also, of course, Eastern neighborhood and Southern neighborhood. And uh, another topic that has become, uh, again, more and more important is the connectivity issue, um, which is seen not only as something uh, with respect to China, but also with China, uh, but to take the approach that connectivity, that we should have an answer to, uh, to the policy, others, and first and foremost China, but in the energy field, of course, also Russia and others, uh, are doing that we should have an answer to that, which does not have to be confrontative, but we should have our own um, answer and our own proposals also. So I think there's also there are also chances in that uh, in that issue of connectivity, which uh, which we will uh, follow up on. Yeah, and then of course uh, all conclusions that have to be drawn from the pandemic, uh, both in uh, concerning health. Um, and, and fighting uh, pandemics, preparedness uh, for that, but also economically, uh, they should also be drawn by the countries of the Western Balkans, and there are also a lot of opportunities in it. Um, so you mentioned the reshoring, uh, which was also already on everyone's mind before, but which has become even more important and even more obvious uh, with the pandemic. Um, and uh, I also believe uh, that you should make your voice heard uh, in the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, there's a lot of sympathy for that. Um, it was mentioned during the first plenary session uh, that the Western Balkans should have a possibility uh, to, to take part. You might know or 
uh, you might not know or not want to know that this was a very difficult undertaking, uh, the whole setup, to agree on the whole setup and to get it started. But now it has started and uh, there are huge possibilities both for uh, countries officially, uh, and I hope uh, there, there will be some offer uh, how the Western Balkans uh, can take part. But there's also the possibility of uh, taking part, uh, and that is for sure already there, and you don't have to wait for anyone uh, to take part in that citizens dialogues and make, um, do uh, inputs, uh, discussions, et cetera, with partners from the EU, uh, from your perspective. I think that would be most welcome also, uh, because I remember, uh, that very vivid discussion uh, which we had in, in 2018 uh, on, on the EU um, in Skopje, which was much more inspiring than other such uh, discussions uh, you might have in, in uh, EU member states. Um, so this is really, I, I would like to appeal to you to take that opportunity and also to take part at least in the civil society discussions on the conference, on the future of Europe, um, and, and to bring in a lot of, uh, of really concrete ideas, uh, what is important and what should be done. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, to both of you. Um, looking, looking at the time, I'm afraid we, we will have to close this, um, this discussion. Thank you so much for both of your con constructive ideas and suggestions. Um, my colleague has also already posted um, a policy brief um, written by Marco and his colleagues um, in, in the chat with, with many more ideas also on, on what can be done um, to... to um, to strengthen the EU's role and to 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 make to make sure the momentum is not lost despite the difficult situation and yeah let's let let's hope that um, Sabine Stur's optimism um, spreads spreads on and and we will come to a solution um, sometime soon so once again thank you so much also to to all of um, our our audience and I wish all of you a nice afternoon thank you <laughs> goodbye.